the thing I say all the time is that if we just give Mother Nature the opportunity, she will come back in bounds. We just have to give her the chance to do so. We need to give her the clear or the, the water quality and the seagrass will follow, the mangroves will follow, the oysters will follow. Um, but without that clean water quality, um, we're kind of dancing around um, this delicate conversation of what are we supposed to do. planting seagrass restoration units that look kind of like this. Um, seagrass in the Indian River Lagoon has uh, been dying off due to water quality and other issues recently in the last 10-ish years. And so we are um, researching ways that it helps to restore them. So all of the grass that you see here was actually collected by volunteers along the shores of the Indian River Lagoon. They walk the shores and um, this really allows us to engage the community. We have volunteers that come out for the whole week prior to when we were gonna do a project and they sit there and they are the ones that put each individual piece of seagrass on these mats. And so while they're there, you know, they're touching the, the resource that we're trying to save, right? And so it provides a little bit more environmental stewardship and helps them facilitate this feeling of connectivity with the habitat, which is really, really beautiful. Um, so all of these seagrasses have been collected off the shores of the Indian River Lagoon and then we plant them in our um, nurseries at FOS. And then um, once they grow really healthy and happy, we put them on these burlap planting units. Um, we use these because it helps for their little roots to have something to establish onto. They can dig into these burlap holes and um, have something to grow on and to hold on to. We planted some of these up in NASA recently and we actually saw some different species of seagrass recruited onto our mats. So we know that they're a really good place to um, recruit seagrass onto and have roots dig into the little burlap mats. Yeah, so if you talk to locals, they say, um, as little as 50 years ago, the water was crystal clear. And then just with the increase in urbanization, you have more runoff, especially in the summertime when it rains a lot. Um, so you have more nutrients going into the system, which then increases the um, algal blooms present. And so what algal blooms do is sucks up all the oxygen in the water and then creates a thick film on the top. So it blocks light from hitting the seagrass. And that's one of the number one things seagrass needs to grow is light, just like any other plant. And so when you lose that factor, you're gonna start losing your seagrass. So the main like, culprit in general is nutrients. And then the second culprit behind that is gonna be salinity, changes in salinity. So seagrass uh, on average will say like around 23 uh, parts per thousand. So when you have runoff from these rivers or runoff from Lake Okeechobee that drops that salinity to zero for weeks, sometimes months at a time, that really stresses the seagrass and it kills it. And so you have the stress from the nutrients, then you have the stress from the freshwater intrusion or just freshwater input, I should say. Um, that in turn is just gonna stress it to the point that it can't um, sustain itself, especially when it was already stressed from previous years. So seagrass is a foundation species, which means that a lot of other um, species rely on it, whether it's plants or animals. And so um, here in the Indian River Lagoon, you have seagrasses, mangroves, oysters. Those are your main foundation species. They anchor all the communities around them. And then as a foundation species, they provide a lot of ecosystem services. And an ecosystem service is essentially a benefit that um, is provided indirectly by one of these habitats. So seagrasses, they provide habitat for um, fish, a lot of the very important commercially and recreational important fish here in um, Florida. So the fish will spend some time of their, or some part of their life cycle in the seagrass. You have the invertebrates that live in there, so that's what the fish come in and feed on, right? That's one of the main things that, as a fisherman, you know if there's a seagrass flat, you're gonna go fish it and find those holes because there's gonna be a big uh, speckled trout sitting in it, right? 
Um, but there's also so many other things that they do. So they provide um, protection to the shoreline. So when you have the seagrass that's coming up from the sediment, as waves are moving over it, it's slowing those waves down, right? It's kind of baffling it. And so by the time that the waves hit the shoreline, it's not going to cause as much damage because there was something to slow the velocity. Just better understanding how the seagrass is able to pull nutrients from the sediment, um, transform it into a usable form of nutrients that another animal can use, whether it's, you know, eating the biomass of it. Um, or sequestering the carbon that is very important because of climate change, right? The more carbon that we have sequestered in plant biomass and below ground, the better it is for the mitigation of climate change. So if you don't have seagrass, you know, if someone comes down here, they're visiting, there's no seagrass, it's just a barren moonscape, you probably aren't going to go there and fish that area, right? You're going to go find somewhere that does have that structure because with that structure brings function. Um, and once you lose the seagrass, you potentially start to lose the other ecosystems around it. You may lose clams. One reason that we're restoring clams and seagrass together is the seagrass helps to protect the clams. And unfortunately here in the IRO, we lost all of our clams. Um, the whole uh, fishery crashed in, uh, I want to say, 2010. And so we've been trying to restore clams, they filter feed. So when sediment is being pushed up into the water column due to waves, it's harder for them to filter feed. But if there's seagrass next to it to slow that water down and make sure that that sand isn't being kicked up, they can feed better. And when they're feeding, now they're cleaning the water, they're um, going and doing a lot for nutrient cycling of the area. And so it's just going back to the foundations because they really anchor not only other of other foundation species, but they're also anchoring us as humans, right? We want to be in a place that has clear water, that has um, fishery, that we can go kayaking and see cool critters as we're doing that to go snorkeling, and without the seagrass, you don't have that. And usually by the first time period, the first month after we plant these, we actually are able to not see the burlap anymore. And yesterday when we were at our other site, a month later, it, we saw growing, expanding edges, which is pretty cool. So that you know that the grass is growing well in these cages. I am very optimistic about the research that we're putting into this. I am a less optimistic about the potential water quality issues that could come along and literally take this from where it is right now and in a week from now it could all be gone. So um, just hope that we can make some changes on how we deal with our water quality here in the Indian River Lagoon so projects like this can continue to flourish.